Hello, everyone. Welcome. Happy Juneteenth and happy Father's Day to all of our fathers and father figures who have been someone in someone's life. Um, welcome today. We are celebrating and just our freedom conversations um, and just loving each other. So I'm just glad to sit here um, with these three amazing people who have shown their um, achievements and love within not only their alma mater, but the HBC community itself. Uh, so I'll kick things off. Um, I just want to appreciate and just celebrate um, um, just, just our love and our peace together and to just center us and just say thank you for everyone's just continuation of um, being a voice for our schools and um, allowing um, all of us just to be here. And so I am Tavon Blair. I'm a proud alumnus of Dillard University in New Orleans, Louisiana, as you can see on my shirt. Uh, and I'm here um, celebrating our freedom discussions from um, just knowing that we have an opportunity for us to um, talk, get to know each other, and know that um, our Davia is here to uh, provide this space for us and HBCU alum. So as I stated myself, I'm going to introduce Ebony Gordon, an amazing alum of Tennessee State University. Um, and they're also here with a Darian Williams from Grambling State University um, and Pastor Glotavia Morris. Um, and so today's conversation is us get to know each other, know our love and support. Um, for our HBCU culture and how we celebrate freedom ourselves. Um, and so just to kick things off, I want to know a little bit more about you all and have our audience know more about you all as well. So, um, Ebony, I'll kick it off for you when I say my first question. And so, of course, it's like, you know, tell me about yourself, um, like what HBCU attend, which I already said that, but um, say it again in your nice HBCU greeting voice. Um, the degree you earned and um, the year you graduated, and why are you actually here today? Like, what award did you win? Like, let us know all of that. Yeah, good evening. It's afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Ebony Gordon. I use she, her pronouns. I am a 2014 graduate of Tennessee State University, where I earned my bachelor's degree in criminal justice. Um, yeah, I currently live in San Francisco and I, um, I'm pleased to say that I received the Public Health Award for my years of service within the HIV space. So I'm glad to be here with you all today. I'm glad to be able to have this discussion with you all in support of our HBCUs. Amazing. Um, Adarian, great to see you. Oh, you as well, my brother, and thank you all again for tuning in today. Steeped in history with the long-standing legacy of tradition, service, excellence, and exemplifying my alma mater's motto, Grambling State University, the place where everybody is somebody. As Devon stated, I'm a Darian Williams. I am a 2019 graduate of Grambling State University. Um, as an undergraduate student, I was uh, extremely involved, as I'd like to say, uh, serving uh, the Student Government Association uh, here on our campus as president for two consecutive terms, as well as the student member to the Louisiana Board of Regents, uh, went on to have a nice career on Capitol Hill. And after some time, worked with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation as the senior manager of congressional relations. And I recently returned back to my alma mater to serve as deputy chief of staff in the office of the president. And many of you probably know that I will be on the ballot next year um, as state representative representing Louisiana's 11th district. I want to recognize leadership. Um, I didn't say that I was a former two term SJ president as well. That's how I met Adarian. Um, and just seeing the, the amount of HBCU, like, you know, then students continuing their leadership and serving their community. And so when you think about someone who is, um, has a passion and love for their school, like all of us are like wa walking um, soldiers and representatives of our alma mater. And so um, Adirian, just want to celebrate you, um, just seeing your leadership grow over the years. Um, and yes. But um, last but not least, um, Pastor Glotavia, uh, would you introduce yourself and just let us know a little bit more about yourself? Yes, hello everyone. My name is Glotavia Morris, um, or Pastor Glo. Um, 
I like that. I attended and graduated from the luxurious Claflin University, the oldest HBCU in the state of South Carolina. Um, I represent the class of 2017. While at Claflin, I served as the uh, all of my class chaplains. Um, I served on the committee of chaplains as well as the SGA chaplain um, for my school. And I majored in religion and philosophy as well as middle level education with concentrations in history and mathematics. Um, I currently um, am employed with Head Start. Um, Low Country Community Action Agency, where I serve as the Family Service Coordinator, serving two counties, Hampton and Collison counties. Um, I reside in a small town called Allerton, South Carolina. Um, we don't have a stoplight, but I do um, reside here. And yeah, I'm a pastor in the community. And my ministry is I Glow Different, which is recognizing testimonies to bring forth transformation in the lives of everyone. And Tavon, if I may interject there, um, it's such a pleasure to be amongst such beautiful Black women. Um, you and I have a wonderful pleasure today. And um, I was just reminded that I did not uh, state uh, the degrees that I received from Grambling. And so I received two bachelor's degrees, one in music, one in visual and performing arts. Um, I minored in political science, long story. Uh, we'll get into that later. Um, and I will be continuing my studies. Um, well, I started at George Washington University in the MPP program, and we'll be finishing up the program here in the fall. Darian's also cross paths with me. We're going to the same grad school. <laughs> uh, but yes, um, just glad to be in you all spaces. And I know we have like 2017, 2018. And Ebony, what year were you when you graduated? Um, 2014. 2014. Okay. So we're going to go all the way back to like 2010. Um, I was in high school then, but Ebony, that would have been your freshman year of college, correct? Yeah. For sure. uh, and so like all of us, like I know like 2020 was the year that HBCUs were like everybody's topic of discussion. Um, and so many high school students during 2020, they were able to like see, oh, wow, like there's a school in South Carolina, you know, called Claflin. Why, you know, I want to see how I can learn more about Claflin. I want to more, learn more about um, Grambling, Louisiana, that is in the northern part of the state. Like what, you know, where, how can I find more about this school? Um, and so I can say that it provided more opportunities for students um, that were seeking um, more knowledge about black colleges and wanting to enroll in black colleges. And I know for many of us, we may not, we may have known about, you know, that there were black schools that existed. We probably didn't know all the names of them. And so I would say for these past two years, we've been able to, um, the current generation of students going to college have a different experience than we had of learning about HBCUs. I know for myself, I didn't know about Dillard until I went on a college tour. Uh, I'm from Chicago, so there's no HBCUs up there. Uh, and so, so happened, I took a trip to Louisiana and found out about Dillard and grew my love for Dillard. I imagine myself, so we have this thing called the Oaks and like the grass area. And um, it's, you know, told that you should not walk on those Oaks um, or you will not graduate in four years. Um, and so things like that, I know all of our HBCUs have those little things, um, but I wanna reflect and just kind of talk about like, you know, how did, um, so I'll start with um, Past the Glow. I like saying that. Um, how did you end up in class? And like, what was your, you know, your love story to your HBCU? And, you know, if you wanted to attend a different, if you had intentions to attend a different university, you know, um, what was that? Maybe class was your number one. Um, but I know for a lot of us, um, our HBCU decision, everything happens for a reason, but um, education-wise, not knowing about our schools, we may have never thought from freshman to senior year of, of high school that we were going to go to our, our alma mater now. So, pass the glow. Let's talk. Okay, so my journey may be a little bit different. I'm not sure. I was, um, I didn't, I wasn't raised in a household that my parents were afforded the opportunity to attend college. Um, my mom had me when she was 40. My dad was 52. So I had older parents, um, but I did have mentors 
that became my sorority sisters later on. And um, they kind of navigated me through school. And so once um, senior year came, I applied. I really wanted to go to Spelman. That was my number one choice, um, but I did not apply because of, at the time my father was sick. So my dad was sick majority of my life. So I didn't want that distance between us. Um, so my mentor, she actually was a Claflin alum and I applied, got accepted. And when I did my first tour, I fell in love with the campus. And I was just like, it just feels right. It's something about it. It felt like home. It felt like I had the support without even knowing the people. And so that's how I ended up at Claflin. And I wouldn't take anything for that journey because it exposed me to so much, so many opportunities. And I know we're going to get into that later on, but that is kind of my story of how I got there. I was accepted into other PWIs, but I never even toured. After I went to Claflin, I was just like, this is it. There's no more discussion. This I'm with my people. And so that's kind of how I got to Claflin with choosing an HBCU. And you, um, of course, you give back to your alma mater and in love and in absolutely and in absolutely coins. the coins. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I love that. Um, I have to visit South Carolina because I have not. I've been in North Carolina. I've been in South Carolina. Um, I have a lot of friends from Claflin, so I would love to visit the campus and just, you know, see the love that you have for your school. And so I, I've been to Tennessee State and I've been to Grandma, so I got to go make my visit to Claflin. Um, Adarian, um, if anybody knows Adarian or like follows Adarian, he is like, if Miss, I think there is a Mr. Gramlin, but if there was a Mr. Gramlin, Adarian takes that title. Well, thank you so much for that, brother. Uh, listen, so I was born and raised in a very small town, Simsboro, which is probably about six minutes, if that, uh, from Grambling. However, um, during my junior year of high school, I started applying to every other college but Grambling. Uh, reason being because if you live six minutes away from the university, it's just like, okay, you pass by there every day, you see people, you uh, interact with students and faculty and administration on a daily uh, and continuous basis. And so it's just like, I wanted to get away. I wanted to go somewhere else, um, primarily in the state of Louisiana. And so again, I applied to every other school, PWIs, um, HBCUs as well in the state. And it dawned on me literally, probably a couple of uh, months before I graduated from Grambling High School. Um, and so for those that don't know, at the time, uh, we had a laboratory school system here in Grambling. And so connected to the university was uh, elementary school, uh, middle school and at high school. And so I went to all of those schools. So I had been in the Grambling uh, school system since pre-K. And so, um, you know, anyone who had that same experience would want to get away, right? Um, but when I made the decision to come to Grambling, I can tell you it was the best decision that I had ever made. And I don't think it was a decision that I made on my own. I think it was a decision that God uh, had destined for me. And so uh, literally a day after I graduated from high school, I started summer school here at Grambling and um, loved the experience, got involved in so many different organizations and SGA and uh, just took, you know, everything uh, for what it was worth. And uh, Grambling has afforded me, again, opportunity after opportunity. Uh, the network is so great and so strong, uh, the rich tradition and um, the connection to Black history that we don't necessarily uh, get a feel for until we get here, until we experience the struggle of attending an HBCU, not just financially, but uh, being involved and, and saying, hey, the food in the cafeteria is not as good as we want it to be, or uh, fighting for financial resources for a university where it's just like, okay, as HBCUs, we've always done more with less. When is the time gonna come where we can do more with more, right? And so that experience for me um, was uh, wonderful. And I'm just glad to be back here uh, serving at Grambling as the Deputy Chief of Staff to the President. Did I see that coming uh, anytime soon? No. Uh, folks uh, tell me all the time, I can see you becoming the president of Grambling someday. Um, but I, I didn't think that I would be back so soon, but I guarantee, 
guarantee you, if you uh, stay grounded in your uh, history, if you stay grounded in your roots, uh, your black roots, and uh, for those of you who uh, do believe in, in, in God and faith and Christianity, um, having that faith will lead you every step of the way. There are going to be times where you, where you shy off of that path, but every single time there will always be an alignment that will get you back on the path that you're uh, meant to be on. So I uh, definitely grateful uh, for Grambling, my Grambling family. And uh, we have so much more in store. We're getting ready to open our uh, first uh, digital library in the state of Louisiana. And uh, from my understanding, the first uh, digital library on any HBCU campus. And so this is not just a uh, celebration for Grambling, but this is a celebration for all of us. And so we're looking forward to uh, doing much more with what we have, but again, looking forward to the time where we can do more with more. Darian, what's that exit um, when you're going exit to- 81. Exit 81. Um, so I visited Grambling this past um, um, December for their winter graduation. And I'm from a big city. Um, I'm from Chicago. My coworkers tell me I sound from Chicago every day. Um, and, uh, when I went to, uh, we stayed the night in Ruston uh, mm -hmm. and then drove over to Gramlin for the graduation. And um, I fell in love with like that part of Louisiana. I've always been like in New Orleans, VR, but never traveled up um, and like stayed overnight. And so uh, it was just a great experience. And so like our final day, um, we ended up going over to, I would say a, a mother of Gramlin. Um, I can't remember her name right now, but she welcomed me into her home mm -hmm. and offered me tea. And I'm like, I don't really drink tea like that, but I'll drink some tea. Um, and just fell in love. Like I was like an adopted kid of, of Bramlin. Like she was like, you one of my kids now. Mm -hmm. um, and just an amazing experience. So you have not been to Gramlin, no friends that went to Gramlin. Just take a trip down there with them. It's so much love. Um, in this city that surrounds just like generations of people that love this one center space. So I'll come down for one homecoming, but yeah, it's an amazing. And that, and that story that you just told is the story of not only just Grambling, but of HBCUs, right? Being able to come into an environment, into a community and just really just hold each other with open arms and welcome each other in and be a part of a supporting um, environment and unique uh, networking opportunities and uh, just growing from there. I mean, you see folks who come in as freshmen and they, you know, uh, start a different way or they communicate a different way. And then once they graduate, seeing them walk across the stage and be a totally uh, changed individual for, for the best um, is, is what it's all about. Um, Let's give me chill. Our HBCUs give us chills for real. Like, <laughs> it was a great experience, y'all. And like, look, what Adarian is saying that um, whenever someone wants to like come to Dillard or like when I went to, um, I go to Savannah State sometimes, that culture, you feel it and you feel that experience. And people ask us about, you know, our HBCU experience or, you know, if we're trying to tell them about our experience, it's hard for us to explain it because it's a feeling that you really can't remake if you are not in that space. Um, you can go like, of course, be up in DC trying to have like HBCU things from like so folks from Louisiana, but it's it's only a space that's created by people that understand what that experience is like and being open to wanting to accept that experience. Um, and so I even been over to Tennessee State um, University as well. Um, I've been once, didn't go through a home campus, so the campus was empty when I went, but I was able just to see like, so this is the area where people stand at, where all that stuff you have. It's this one big picture that's on Google that like, I think it's y'all quad or something or like the core area. It's a big old circle with like elevated stairs. It was beautiful. Um, and so, Ebony, tell us about your, uh, your journey to Tennessee State University and why TSU is TSU. And, you know, I know y'all got your competition with Texas Southern, um, but just let's talk to us. Yeah, so um, I'm a first generation college graduate. Um, I come from an immigrant parent. And so I think my parents always wanted me to go to college because they didn't have the opportunity to. And I knew I 
never wanted to go to any other place where there are going to be majority non-Black people. And so I really wanted to steep myself in like Black culture, Black HBCU culture, because that's a whole nother level of things. Um, and so I considered a few other like HBCUs, but I visited like so many other people have said, like I visited the campus and I was like, this is it. Like this feels like home. And I grew up in Nashville. So um, I was able to, you know, go to a few homecomings as a youth and um, just spent um, some similar spaces with people who had so many loving things to say about Tennessee State. And so, like I said, when I visited, I knew that it was for me. And so I didn't really get too much like pushback from anyone other than you've got to get a good education no matter where you go. And so, yeah, I, I, it was solidified for me that um, a Black university was the way to go. Um, so my question to all of y'all, I just want to do like a little popcorn, um, is if you, like what's your, so not your HBCU, but what's your dream HBCU or, or a school that you have a lot of love for? So like I'll explain a little bit, like, so like for myself, I didn't know about HBCUs, but um, I, over time, I realized I have a lot of love for FAMU, FAMU alum, and just the culture and love and energy they have for their alma mater. Um, so if you had a day to step to step into the shoes of someone from another HBCU, what HBCU would that be? Ebony, you can jump right in and say it. <laughs> Yeah, I have a few. Uh, my sister went to Spelman and I always thought that she had such a beautiful experience there. And so Spelman would have been one. Um, FAMU seems like a fun place. Um, Howard just seems like so many powerful, like black people spend time at Howard. And yeah, I really had a few in mind. Tennessee State has a really great band. And so um, they drew me, who else is have uh, good bands Jackson State like there's so many like I said for many different reasons Adarian this is a hard question for you so I'm, I'm, that's, that's a tough question I know you ain't gonna that's say that that's a tough question because if you literally cut me open right now, I won't will not only bleed red but I will bleed black and gold. Uh, but for the sake of the question. I would say uh, definitely Howard, uh, and that's just because of my time being there in DC, uh, getting a chance to interact uh, on their campus. Um, I would also say Dillard, I've never been to Dillard. Um, I've been to Tennessee State before, uh, Jackson State, um, and what the heck, Southern University. <laughs> I always say it. Okay, make sure y'all screen record that, okay? But, but listen, let's not forget who the baddest band in the, in the land is, the world-famed Tiger Marching Band. So, you know. There we go. I um, So, like, how you and, and, and Southern's relationship is, um, that's how Dillard and Xavier relationship is in New Orleans. And so, like, I'm pretty sure if you wear Southern or anybody wears Southern attire on Grandma's campus, they're like, their eyes are getting burned. Like, people are burning them with their eyes. And that's how it is for Xavier. So like at Dillard, I was what my freshman year, like I I had a Xavier hoodie because I like was going to all different campuses my high school year. Um, and I wore a Xavier, you know, throw over like this um, to on, on the yard, what we say the Oaks. And um, the uh, like alum who worked at the school, like literally like pulled me to the side and said, what are you doing? Like, you cannot do that. You cannot wear that. Uh, well, that's not what we do here at Dillard. Um, and I had a Howard hat my sophomore year and they were like, what are you doing? Like, no, but I think it's, it's important for us to have a love and just share like community for our schools. Even if we didn't go there, we just have an understanding that like this school had its own rich history that I also can love. Like one thing I do is read the archives of a lot of our schools. Um, there's so much history in them. Uh, and so it, it helps me to grow and know like, what were students experiencing in the 1950s, even the 1930s, um, and how that, that culture shifted over the years. So folks don't know, um, Dillard and Xavier, like we used to have football teams. I'm not sure if Claflin had one too, but I know like a lot of smaller schools, we used to have football teams back in the day. And like all our programs just like stopped like in the 60s or like the 50s. Um, and so like those, like that was a part of like the HBC experience that people had that like our current students don't experience, uh, but it is something good to know. 
Uh, so that was very bold of you, Darian, to uh, to say Southern, because I love me some Xavier too. Um, but it's not recognized for us to like show love and honor to other schools. You know, we have our little competitions with games, but in all, we love each other regardless of where we go. Um, so past the glow, let's talk about um, what school you would have a super duper love for. Of course, Spelman, like I stated before, because um, I wanted that experience of being around other driven Black women. Um, so Spelman was definitely um, my first choice. And um, I would say North Carolina a t State University. They're very, um, their campus is very energetic. Um, I have one of my mentees go there now. And if I could say another one, Hmm. it'll probably be Howard only because of, you know, it's being in DC area and, you know, the sorority fraternity, all of that, the vibe of the campus. So I would say those three. Okay. Well, I'm going to show some love to, um, to Tougaloo, um, to Fort Valley State, to Savannah State, to um, Albany State University. Um, there's just so many schools that we have um, across the country that like, you know, whoever is watching today, um, to know that, that out of the schools we've named, there's so many more. Uh, we can celebrate Morris Brown College, um, Talladega University now. Well, no, it's, I'm sorry, Talladega College, but the Edward Waters University is what Edward Waters is now. Um, and celebrating all of those schools, there's so many talented Black, um, leaders like ourselves have attended or just walked the same the same spaces on um, people like Martin Luther King have walked on on this you know in the same like halls that um even not just Morehouse but just other campuses he spoke at um uh, during his time here on this earth um and just knowing that just black actors we're talking about Juneteenth talking about um just celebrating black and just like our freedom we have to like HBC is a part of that conversation and so a lot of us know that we come in, as Adrian was saying, that people come into these schools and um, they, they kind of transform over the years. And so from that freshman, sophomore year, I'm not sure what development pieces happen there, but it really does a kickstart of who we are as people. Um, and it helps prepare us in our workforce and like, you know, what we do and what we, what we want to do professionally. Um, so let's talk career. I want to know, like, um, talk more about what we're doing professionally um and kind of like maybe was there something on your hb on your hbcu campus that led you to do that career-wise um and so i just want to learn more so past the glow let's talk about your career and you know what you're doing and how you're impacting um like in your everyday life of your career okay so um i always say i don't this is not the path i chose for myself but I'm a believer and I just believe that everything that God's, God does, he does it in his own time and for his own purpose. Um, so originally I was supposed to go to school just to be a middle school teacher, mathematics, because I knew I had to be a teacher in order to become a principal. I've always wanted to be a principal ever since pre-K. I have it on a script of paper that I wrote out, spelled it correctly and all. And, you know, my journey, the age something about the HBCU journey just it like it shifts your perspective on everything you know and so going in I was like this is all I'm doing and around my sophomore junior year um I had the opportunity to do an internship junior year with UNCF um with the Walton Fellowship for K-12 reforming education experience um and when I came back to the campus, I was just like, you know, well, you know, you have the test for education and all of that. I took it. I was kind of lazy on it because I was like, I don't want to do it, but maybe I'm feeling something else. I want my own school. So I want to do this. And so um, I started taking religion and philosophy classes and I started really, really having like a very interest in it because I feel like with education, being that I trained myself from elementary to college focused on education, I got kind of bored with it because I felt like, well, I already know all of this. So I got a little relaxed. Um, when I came back from my internship, I was sitting in class one day and my 
professor at the time, he said, um, you really wrestling with a call on your life. And I was like, mm, yeah, I know my mom's a pastor, not trying to go down that route. But um, I did my paper. I was so nervous because he was grading it as a seminary paper. And I was like, sir, I don't know why you're doing all of this. So he did it and he gave me my paper back last. And he was like, you totally aced your paper. And I was like, I don't know why, because I really don't care for English, but okay. And he said, you're wrestling with the call. And I said, I believe I am. And um, I was going to do the paper for, to add religion and philosophy minor. And while I'm sitting there doing the paper, I'm writing and God literally, he says, why are you minoring in something I need you to major in? So, you know, I'm sitting in this office like, okay, I hear you. Um, I'm trying to do some other things. So I finally, I switched. I told him, I was like, I have to switch my whole paper because I need to minor in the, I mean, I need to major in, in this and education, do all of that. And now I see the importance of why I had to do that. I did not know I was going to be a pastor. So my HBCU experience pushed me forward into ministry. It was always something I had interest in, but didn't want to do because I've, I've seen so much of the struggle for my mom and for my dad that I didn't want to go down that same path. And so my HBCU experience um, pushed me into it. I was on a gospel choir and I was able to practice my ministry even the more. And so as as I'm, you know, in life now, I'm looking back on it. I was like, I would never want to, you know, teach little babies. I can't do the snot, the boogie. I can't do all of that. But he takes me back to the beginning with Head Start. And when I say it made a woman out of me and it gave me a different perspective. And the Lord told me, you know, I have to take you through this bottom so that you can see the full experience of a child's life so that when you do get your own school when you do start implementing different programs able to give back to your community with a greater passion and so now I'm a family service coordinator I help families in low income areas all of that and my religion and philosophy degree is utilized in my ministry and how I comprehend and how I how I'm able to minister to people that may not believe in God, but still give them a word that'll help carry them over, even if they don't comprehend who there is. So um, I would say my whole HBCU experience really changed the trajectory of my life and for the better, even though I didn't understand the purpose, I had to recognize that God had a plan and it far outweighed my, my feelings or how I felt in the moment, but the mission far outweighed that. So yeah, I didn't mean to say all of that, but... <laughs> We call that a testimony. Uh, <laughs> so that's what you gave us. And that, like, when you said that it was the professor or, or like, who he saw that in you um, and you were like, no, like, that's not what I want to do. <laughs> um, and so it's, our HBCUs have that specific, like, piece of thread and, like, um, pushes us towards our, our goals and the things that we want to do and kind of our purpose in life. Um, and I didn't attend the PWI for undergrad, so I can't say that, like, you know, it's a different experience. But I know for our experiences, we, um, we met someone on our campus that played a very pivotal role in who we are today and why we're doing the work that we do. Um, so just wanted to reflect on what you said and know that, like, all of us and even people watching, um, if you are an alum or a student, know that that person that keeps, like, knocking on your door telling you that you need to be doing something, um, and you may be pushing back and pushing back, just um, give it thought and just try to figure out why this person keep pushing me to like wanting to, to you know, develop, you know, this, this skill that I, that I have that I don't want no parts in. I don't want to do it, but it's something there. Um, but just give it a try and see if you like, you know, the, um, that path of like, you know, career, like an internship you want to do, figure that out. I know many of us um, had those experiences and it seems like it was like yesterday, but it was years ago. And so now we are looking uh, about four or five years from when we graduated and what we're doing today. Um, so Ebony, um, I know that, you know, you working in, in um, with like, you know, public health and healthcare, like HBCUs play a huge role in all of this. And I know that um, you being specifically in the place that your hometown also going to school at, 
um, you see your impact daily? Yeah, so I studied criminal justice, as I mentioned before, um, because I always felt, I don't know, like that even people in that kind of position needed some compassionate support because there's trauma connected to a life of crime, you know, there's trauma in being accused of crime. And so I always, always wanted to provide it like compassionate support without judgment to to um, people coming in and out of prisons and jails. And so um, I took the time to like educate myself on how powerful like incarcer incarceration programs, like education, like support groups, like a case manager. Like I um, took the time to understand how powerful those could be for people wanting to um, consider life changes or, you know, whatever their circumstances may be. I always, you know, felt like that that was was for me. And so um, I pivoted um, after I graduated from college because I needed a job. I did not necessarily want to work in a jail or prison just yet because I felt like I needed more um, preparation for that. So I pivoted and I joined um, an organization as a volunteer who provided services to people, you know, who are in need of like care and prevention for HIV. And so I kind of fell into that work and have stayed in it for almost eight years because I found that it has been such meaningful and like passionate work and you're connecting with people like in such vulnerable places in their lives. And so I found that that was the connector between the two, that whole compassionate support without judgment and that whole kind of thing. And so um, even like in my like matriculation, I made sure that I focus my studies on like mental health and counseling support. Um, and so, yeah, that's pretty much like what I do now, just provide that kind of community um, voice and support for, for the HIV community. And so, um, yeah, like I said, I've been here for almost eight years now. I absolutely love it. Um, I do am pursuing um, a graduate degree in mental health um, counseling, but I did pause that because I had to focus on my own mental health and journeys through like mood disorders and things of the sort. So um, yeah, but I, I'm going to continue like doing this very, very important work because it is needed. You need somebody who is who you're always going to see there who's in support of you no matter what, um, with, you know, with compassion and empathy and um, non-judgment. So Ebony, you said that you finished your degree for criminal justice, correct? I did, yes. Okay, so see, um, a lot of like students be caught up in, um, like I studied this, I have to do this professionally, like that's, that's what I, my box is, I gotta live in this box. Um, and that's not true. Like there's so many different opportunities and ways that we can see, um, well, our path aligns for us to see that, um, our purpose can be something completely different than what we thought we were gonna do crossing that stage. Um, so that's just a perfect example. Uh, so thank you for sharing your story. Yeah, I also wanna add that um, I studied the, um, like the class manual or like where you could choose out your courses. I studied that like from cover to cover for my program and just saw what options were available for um, classes for me to study. And so I did that from even like when I first applied to, to Tennessee State, I was like, okay, they offer this, this, and this, and this is how I wanna arrange my schedule. And I rarely ever went to my advisor because she was, no offense, she was a white woman. And so I just didn't feel like we could connect on that kind of level. And so I pretty much advised myself <laughs> through college and made sure that I tailored my coursework to what I felt was right for me. Look at you, <laughs> stepping up. <laughs> um, Adarian, if you can tell us more about um, your career and just, I know you do a lot of work in the community, but also you have um, your career on the, the Hill. You're also at Gramlin working in a sovereign institution, um, but you also have a music degree too. So let's talk, let's talk about it all. <laughs> Sure. Well, listen, uh, I have to start with this and I'm going to be using this from now on. An anointed Black woman by the name of Pastor Glow said, why are you minoring in what you should be majoring in? <laughs> so uh, just take it back just a little bit. Um, so anyone that knows me knows that um, I've always had a great talent for uh, singing as well as acting. And so um, I've also 
since a young boy, uh, been involved in the community, whether it was advocacy, whether it was policy. And so at a young age, folks would tell me that I wouldn't be able to do both. Uh, you can't go and do music and theater and then, you know, find yourself becoming someone's state representative or whatever else God has planned for me in the political arena. Um, and so that was a word for me to continue to do what I was doing. And so once I decided to come to Grambling, I said, you know what, I'm going to double major. I'm going to double major in music and theater. And uh, like I said, my minor was political science. So I was doing just what folks would, were telling me that I wasn't going to be able to do. And I definitely enjoyed it. So my college experience was uh, similar to this. I would have an eight o'clock class. After that class, I was probably in the president's office advocating or um, sharing complaints uh, from students on a particular issue. And then from that, I would go back to class. And after that, it probably was a meeting in Baton Rouge that I needed to attend, all to come back to campus at about six in the evening and hit the stage. And um, I, my most memorable show to this day um, I think there probably was a total of 14 theatrical productions that I was a part of um, in college, uh, but one that stands out the most was when I portrayed Dr. Martin Luther King in The Mountaintop, and so that's kind of like what my days consisted of of and uh, how I was able to do all of that in one day or just throughout my college experience, um, God, <laughs> you know, um, and time management and uh, understanding that if you are passionate about something, you go for it. Don't let what others say or what other people have to demean uh, what you, you know, have set out to do to uh, distract you from that. And so God literally showed me the difference between, between my uh, my talent and my purpose. And so as I continue, continued to matriculate at Grambling, um, I graduated, uh, well, right before I graduated, I uh, had two internships on Capitol Hill. And so my experience on Capitol Hill really exposed me to a plethora of issues that um, Louisiana primarily faced. I mean, from uh, natural disasters to homelessness to um, and Tavon may remember this, uh, advocating for students um, in regard to TOPS scholarships and so many different things. And um, I had a passion for that. I was an advocate, I am an advocate. And so I've always spoken up on issues that um, seem to go silent in our communities, um, especially those that we're dealing with right now surrounding gun violence and so many other things. Um, but at that particular time, I said, I will continue to do both. And so um, right now I'm serving as the deputy chief of staff to the president. And so uh, with all that heal experience, I'm able to utilize the network, the skills, the policy experience um, to be of benefit for the school that basically created all these opportunities uh, for me. And so I'm just grateful to serve in that capacity. And it also has uh, a bit of uh, local um, ability as well, working with our university foundations, elected officials, uh, both on the federal and uh, state levels. Uh, when it comes to appropriations, I'm the one who's reaching out on behalf of our, of our university saying, hey, you know, we see that this is coming up. Grambling State University has done this, 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 and that. Um, how can we, um, you know, dig into that pot of money when it comes to certain things? And so um, a, a very different experience, but uh, none of that has shied me away from my talent of music and theater. Uh, just uh, this past January, I was Harpo in the color purple. Um, and so I would literally come from work on campus um, and everything and uh, drive out to Monroe where the show uh, took place and uh, totally transform into this uh, different character. And uh, for anybody uh, that has um, a passion for something and for anybody that knows that they have multiple gifts, exercise them in whatever way that you can. Uh, like Tavon said, don't put yourself in a box. Uh, we all have several abilities. We all have several gifts. And so utilize them. Um, it's up to you to do that because you don't want him to give you a gift and then take it away because you aren't using it. Um, so that's uh, me. Um, so I will continue to fight for my people. I will continue to fight for what's right. Um, I will continue to uh, try to create um, a world that's more free because in the world that we live in, it's not so free. Um, and you know, catch me on Broadway someday. <laughs> you never know. We're gonna get a front row. We're gonna see it. 
Um, thank you, um, Adarian, for sharing your story as well and like not limiting yourself um, of like people saying you couldn't do both. And like I've seen those two different phases of Adarian um, and just seeing the leadership and advocacy um, side. And I'm pretty sure your, your time in theater has helped you um, like with articulation of like, you know, when you're speaking in front of groups of people, like all that, you're like, I've done this. So therapeutic, I guarantee you. And, I, and I'm and sure all of you can attest that there is something that you do outside of your work that is therapeutic for you, that keeps you grounded, uh, that keeps you leveled. Um, and that really takes all the stress away. Um, and for me, that's theater, that's music. I can go to them at the end of a stressful day and be at peace. Um, so, you know, find, find whatever that is for you uh, that can keep you grounded and keep you leveled um, in your work, so. Thank you. Um, as we're coming close to um, end of our conversation, I wanna ask two more questions, um, but I also wanna share my story about like, you know, my career, because I haven't said that, I forgot. <laughs> um, and I kind of have a similar story to you all of just like figuring out like purpose and just like seeing how from graduation day to where I am now was completely different. Um, I ended up moving to Atlanta, um, like my first week out of college, um, was interning at UNCF. And as my internship was ending, my supervisor who was an HBCU alum. I met one randomly time when he um, came to, to New Orleans to speak at Dillard. Um, and he's now my mentor. I ended up staying in this house when I needed somewhere to stay when I was living in Atlanta for like a program I was doing. Um, and I ended up working uh, in political communications. Um, in 2018, Stacey Abrams was running for governor and I was managing the interns and volunteers. Um, I was so confused while I was doing that job because I was like, I was just an intern like three months, like three weeks ago. And you know, you want me to manage the interns. Um, and so I had a communications background. I'm like, this is like, at first I was like, I want to be a journalist or do all these different things or do PR. Um, but I never knew like what type of communications I wanted to do. I just knew that it existed because, you know, our schools, they give us the foundation of like this. This is the basic, the foundation is the basic. We need to know all this. But through internships and opportunities and meeting people, you understand like how do you want to use your use your career, use your use your degree in your career. Um, and so working in Georgia, which I currently am and living in Georgia now, um, I saw that um, I saw that we were talking to black voters across um, Georgia and about a governor's like like people didn't know the difference between like a governor or a mayor or different positions. Um, and we in my communications background, like, no, we should say it like this, we should do that. Um, and I realized that there was an opportunity for, um, for me to merge my communications background and also my interest in like advocacy and serving others in, in politics. Um, and so now I'm like, I guess year three in working in political communications, got a master's degree in political comms and um, seeing how much need it is for more black voices and black you know, writers to be in this space. Um, because if you're talking to like black people tell them to go, you know, to be active in their community about issues that are happening, um, it's about the message. And so all of us have found our different ways of like um, talking to people in our community, um, whether that is through, through, um, through you know, healthcare, advocacy, ministry, we still find our way to give back. And so my question is um, like, why do we fight for freedom? Um, or like, what is the importance to you of why you fight for freedom and like your call? Um, so I wanna say that's the first question. I'll ask the second question after. Um, so Pastor Glow, if you can just let us know like your fight for freedom and like why it's so important to you, um, that help us kind of key lead the conversation. Um why do I fight for freedom? Because um, I know what it is to not have the opportunity to navigate or to have a, a not be, I guess, not be in the position where you are aware of what's around you, um, that you are aware of the power that you actually possess. Um, last year, I did a awareness day um, which was to 
community aware of the resources that's within the community um, because we live in small towns, small county that don't get much funding or the funds not allocated the way that it should be. And there are not really opportunities for the youth. So um, I took it upon myself to do that. But while I was doing that, I noticed that it, there were actually not as many resources as I thought it was. And so ever since then, I was charged even the more to either bring some resources in, create some resources or create some avenues for our, our community um, and to ensure that they are, we, are, we are all getting all that we can get. And so I think my fight comes from the angle of ministry, um, mentorship, counseling, and just first liberating the people in their mind and their thinking. Um, I work with a lot of families in uh, within Head Start and the action agency that I'm with that, you know, take on poverty and think that's that's the end or you can't excel past what you're in. Or, and so my, my struggle, and I told my boss is that my struggle right now is trying to balance my ministry and my profession because sometimes they cross up because I'm like, I can feel it. And, you know, you want to pray. And I'm just like, no, can't do that. Got to redirect it. So um, that is my fight. That is why I continue to fight because I want them to be free in their mind, but also after they are free in their mind, I want to have the resources or give them, get them to the resources that's needed for them to continue excel. So that's really my push. Thank you so much. Uh, Darian, you can share your fight for freedom. It, that question is so necessary, but it's a tough one to ask because I think our culture, our Blackness is steeped and rooted in fighting for something. Um, like all of our ancestors have had to fight for something in order for us to be doing what we're doing in order for us to be on this Zoom talking about freedom today. And so uh, my fight comes from experience, uh, comes from um, working with and advocating for people who have gone without. Um, my fight comes from seeing so many of us uh, killed uh, due to careless acts of violence. Um, my fight comes from the effects of racism that we still deal with today. Um, and so with all of that and so much more, um, you know, my hope is that the fight that we are continuing to fight will create some free world, some free country someday for future generations to come. Um, and hopefully we can, you know, be in a world one day where a black man like myself and, and Tavon can uh, jog down the street uh, without being shot down or to, um, you know, wake up in the morning and, and take our children to school without uh, seeing, um, you know, mass uh, shootings, uh, go to the store without, you know, the worry of being, you know, gunned down or, or being uh, harassed by uh, someone of another uh, race. Um, so short answer, my, my fight uh, is continuous and uh, it comes from experience and from um, people. And, you know, that's not going to, a lot of our, our fights that we're saying, it's not going to change tomorrow, but with the continue of um, us in community with each other yeah. and um, providing opportunities for like these conversations. Um, and I'm sure there's a community of people that are, are coming up um, that see the things that we did not see as, as you know, the youth or like as college students. And so more, av more, advocacy, more av advocates are growing and they're gonna be speaking out and doing work to make that change um, over the years. Um, and so thank you, Adarian. And so Ebony, if you can let us know your fight for freedom. Yeah, so I wanna start by saying that um, HIV is very much so an 
issue that is prevalent um, among Black people, Black women specifically. I want to note that Black women make up just 15% of the population of women, but account for over well over half of um, new HIV diagnosis. And so um, I want to note that Black women like fare worse in many aspects of like systemic disparities that includes like physical and mental health and gender-based and par intimate partner violence and all those all of those kinds of things and not necessarily talked about um, in, in public spaces or even amongst like small groups like church like that's not something that is always talked about in church because sexual health is not something that you should talk about at church um, and a lot of people feel that way and so um, I never want to like shy away from like communing with women and black people in support of like the disruption of issues that we face and I think that community support is a pathway to liberation and so it's important for me to provide that kind of community support and like bring people to together to like hold each other up and so um, I'm like blessed with the opportunity to be able to um, celebrate and honor and support Black women, Black folks in general um, in conversations of health and wellness and centering joy and resiliency, happiness, safety, um, pleasure, like all those things mean so much to me and so I'm going to always like keep doing that. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. And just for giving us those statistics too. Um, it's important for us to know about our community um, and how we can help and do the service to ensure that people have access to education um, and resources um, for whatever they're experiencing. And so my final question will be um, for us to give advice to um, an HBCU student um, or possibly someone who aspires to become an HBCU student. Um, so Darian, I'll throw it to you and just share your advice um, for the next generation. My advice, uh, first and foremost, uh, since this is a discussion uh, from some wonderful HBCU grads, uh, is to educate yourself. Um, find that pathway to education for you. Um, and it doesn't have to necessarily be an HBCU, but understand what an HBCU is and uh, what the history uh, behind an HBCU um, encompasses. Um, I would also say uh, get involved in the conversation, uh, whatever you're passionate about. If you're passionate about healthcare, if you're passionate about education, if you're passionate about um, LGBTQ uh, rights, whatever you're passionate about, uh, get involved in those conversations. Um, and it can start right in your community. Um, in your local community, start attending those city council meetings and those school board meetings, not you know, necessarily to go and um, speak, um, but to just be aware um, and really speak up for the Black community um, like never before. And in that speaking up, also be prepared to educate those who aren't uh, knowledgeable about the experiences that we face or the uh, complications that we continue to go through as a people. Uh, we all have um, a fight we all uh, come to a point to where we are unsure what that fight is, uh, but I guarantee you, if you continue to pursue your purpose and understand and don't keep yourself in a box, um, you know, and don't compare yourself to other people, uh, don't compare yourself to the experiences, to the career goals that other people may have, uh, take some time off of social media. I just took two weeks off. Um, yes, I'm running for office uh, here next year, but I still had to take some time off because you will begin to compare yourself to someone that you don't know, someone that is not in the age break bracket as you, and someone that doesn't have the same purpose that God has put on your life. And so stay rooted, stay grounded, stay prayerful. And, um, you know, there will be some good days, there will be some bad days, but I rest assured um, that you will come out successful in the end. Thank you so much. Um, Ebony, um, if you can give us an advice for an HBCU student um, who is aspiring to give back in our community, uh, what would you say? Yeah, very, very similarly to, uh, similarly to what Darian spoke of, like seek out and, and just understand 
what your reasons are behind, behind like the your passion for the liberation of our people. Um, he said that like everyone has their specific lane and some people have many different lanes. And so really like scope out and understand what you think your lane should be. Um, and, and that can morph over time. Like as we've all like kind of alluded to, like that thing mo morphs over time. And so just like really commune with yourself and understand what your reasons are are, and you'll be able to like effectively communicate that to you know the people around you and so it's like a bleeding thing it'll it'll carry out like it'll carry into each other and so um it's not a race don't overwhelm yourself it takes time um success is different for everyone so like Adarian mentioned don't compare yourself take care of you and nurture yourself and find like your healthy balance um, between activation and just rest like Adarian mentioned <laughs> thank you um last but not least plastic glow can you let us know some of your wise words for young folks Sure. Um, I love what Ebony just said um, about commune with yourself, because I think a lot of times we look for validation and confirmation from everyone else, except for, you know, what we already know we have on the inside of us. So I would definitely like to say that as well as what Darian said about just making sure that you stay in your lane and driving, you know, don't just get into what you want to be into and park. But make sure that you're continuing to, um, like we say, matriculate. Um, and so I would also say to uh, take advantage of every opportunity. Take your education serious. Take experience serious because everything you experience in life is for an appointed time. Um, take it serious. Every opportunity, take it serious because every room is designed for you to talk in. Some rooms are just designed for you to have a seat and take in what you need because what you're taking in is what you're probably going to Im imitate. And I always say you intake is what you imitate. So if you intake negativity, you're not focused, that's what you're going to put out. But if you're intaking um, wise words, knowledge, you may not understand why you're getting it all now, but eventually it will pay off, able to use it in different aspects of your life. So um, I would say getting get involved with your community, uh, regardless of whether, you know, begin to bridge some gaps. If, if you know you was a church baby and you feel like the church not offering this and that, speak up. <laughs> speak up. Close mouths don't get fed. So speak up, say what you have to say. And even if they don't agree with it. They have to respect it because it's coming from you. Be confident in who you are. Be bold in who you are. And you have everything inside of you needed for every place you're going. And Tavon, I know we are out of, town, uh, out of time, but uh, Pastor Glow just uh, sparked something in my mind. Don't be afraid to break generational curses. Everything that your family went through does not have to be what you went through. Um, you're going to do some things that no one in your family has ever done before. So don't be afraid of it. Uh, you may not be able to seek advice from particular family members about that, but it's okay. Um, there will be uh, times where, uh, you know, you will uh, get through uh, those things. So don't be afraid to uh, break those generational curses that are um, amongst your family. Thank you all so much. Um, our conversation today um, is just the beginning of so many more conversations. Um, and I just want to thank um, Marquise and the Ardivia team for bringing us together for our HBCU team freedom discussions. Um, have these conversations in your community. Uh, Rewatch this today's conversation. Um, and let's do it. So I'm going to pass it over to Marquise. Um, and thank you again for having us. Howdy, good afternoon. Again, thank you to all of our speakers today. Everyone who spoke is a past winner of this HBCU Tinth Initiative. Tavon Blair was one of our first winners in 2020. And then uh, Ebony, uh, Darian, and Glotavia all won last year's awards. We do look forward to the future of this initiative. 
in the coming weeks, we'll begin to share correspondence of what that will look like in the future. But very long story short, the idea is that from now on, one year we will have awards, and the following year we will have a conversation like this featuring those past winners. So this year, 2022, we had this freedom discussion, and in 2023, we will have more HBCU Teen Freedom Awards featuring HBCU alumni. And we look forward to rolling out not just our new categories of awards, but our new levels of awards that will be able to engage not just our emerging HBCU alumni who've graduated within the past 10 years, but also those more established HBCU alumni who've graduated more than 10 years ago. The last thing we definitely want to do is show appreciation to all of our different sponsors and partners who make this happen. We intentionally seek to partner with as many black owned businesses as possible. So we're very grateful to have the continued support of Black Girl Sunscreen in this initiative, uh, Nyeja Grill Spice Mix, <clears throat> now Jelana's Bake Shop, and Hot Chocolate in Maryland. So, and in the future, we're seeking to involve more black owned businesses and partners in these initiatives. So please definitely stay involved and HBCU students, uh, let's take something from this conversation. Future HBCU students are prospects who are looking to apply to HBCUs. Consider uh, Tennessee State, Grambling State, uh, Dillard University, Claflin University, or definitely the illustrious Florida Memorial University, birthplace of the Negro National Anthem, lift every voice and sing. Thank you for your continued support to Ardevia, and we look forward to continuing to provide more opportunities and resources to our HBCU prospects, students, and graduates. That's our time for today, and I think if no one has anything else, we can go ahead and log off. Have a good one, everybody. Bye-bye.